Hi, everyone. My name is Neil and John of Banerjee, and I'm so excited to invite you all to our event tonight, Love versus Internship, a conversation with YA authors Ed Lin and Marie Myung Oak Lee, moderated by Ruth Mina Bookwald, which is also the launch event for Ed's new novel, David Tan Can't Have a Girlfriend Until He Gets Into an Ivy League College, published by Kaya Press. Uh, I'm the managing editor of Kaya Press, and we're so excited to be publishing David Tung, our first official YA novel this month. And I'm also really heartened to have collaborated on this event with two other Asian American literary nonprofits, the Asian American Writers Workshop and Kundiman. The Asian American Writers Workshop, founded in 1991, is devoted to creating, publishing, developing, and disseminating creative writing by Asian Americans and to providing an alternative literary art space at the intersection of migration, race, and social justice. Kundiman is dedicated to nurturing generations of writers and readers of Asian American literature. They create a space where Asian Americans can explore through art the unique challenges of the diaspora. Their programs include a mentorship lab for emerging writers, creative nonfiction intensives, food writing workshops, and more, especially this, their annual retreat for poet, poets and fiction writers. Uh, I've been noticing both of these organizations have pivoted so gracefully to continuing to provide amazing events and workshops during the pandemic, and we're so glad that people are able to tune into this one from across the country today. This event is also part of the Brooklyn Book Festival's book end series. And I wanted to give a special shout out to former Kaya Press staff person, Johnny Rondhoa, for working so hard to put this event together back in the dark days of spring. Um, I wanted to call out the, uh, the, the copy of Edlin of David Tung, Can't Have a Girlfriend Until He Gets Into an Ivy League College, which has a shiny cover. Uh, so I'm really excited, please. Um, check out this book if you can on the Kaya Press website. Uh, in the chat, there's links to, to buy this book along with other books. So tonight we're going to be hearing readings from Ed Lin, from Marie Ming Oak Lee, and then Ruth will be joining them for a conversation discussing their books and their experience of writing unforgettable Asian American characters over the past plus years. Um, so please, uh, and you'll be able to join in the conversation. And so David Tang officially publishes later this month on October 28th, but you can order today and get your book in the next week from Kaya Press uh, with some special swag. Um, and you can also pre-order Marie's uh, book that is going to be republished later this year, one of her first YA novels, um, directly from Bookshop. Those links are in the chat. So let me introduce our speakers tonight and we'll get started. Ruth Mina Bookwald is a fish, fiction manuscript reader for OK Donkey Press and on the editorial team of Spicy, an online zine and creative collective led by women of color and queer and trans people of color. Her writing has appeared or is forthcoming in electric literature, The Margins, and Tayo. Born in Seoul, South Korea and raised in northern New Jersey, she received a BA in critical and visual studies from Pratt Institute and lives in Brooklyn. Marie Myung Oak Lee, one of the co-founders of the Asian American Writers Workshop, is the author of YA novels Finding My Voice, being re-released re by Soho Teen in December of this year, Necessary Roughness, and Saying Goodbye, as well as the middle grade novels If It Hadn't Been for Yon Jun and Night of the Chupacabras. Her books have won a number of awards, including Friends of American Writers, New York Public Library's Best Books for the Teenage, and NCTE's Children's Choice. She has been a judge for the National Book Awards, a Fulbright Fellow, and was one of the first Korean American journalists allowed into North Korea. And Ed, Ed Lin, a native New Yorker of Taiwanese and Chinese descent, he's the first author to win three Asian American Literary Awards and is an all around stand up kind of guy. His books include Waylaid, published by Kaya in 2002, a mystery trilogy set in New York's Chinatown in the 1970s, This is a Bust, Snakes Can't Run and One Red Bastard, and a mystery series set in Taipei, Ghost Month, Incensed, and 99 Ways to Die. Lin lives in Brooklyn with his wife, the actress Cindy Chung, and son, Walter. I'll be back uh, after the reading with a few more announcements. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Neela, for that great introduction. Um, I'm so happy to be here with some of my favorite people and favorite organizations. Thank you, Kaya, Kudiman, Asian American Writers Workshop, the Brooklyn Book Fest, 
um, and Ruth for moderating and my friend Ed, really congratulations on your book. Very, very excited. And what's really fun for me is my novel, which I'm going to be reading from um, Finding My Voice is almost as old as the Asian American Writers Workshop. So I actually dug out, it's gone in and out of print um, twice. So here are the earlier, and there's a hardcover as well. But I'm going to be just reading a little bit from, from my new old book. It's pretty much um, being republished the same way it was um, more than 20 years ago. So it's considered to be the first contemporary set Asian American YA novel. So I'm just going to read a little bit from the beginning. Uh, from chapter one and a little from chapter two. Moo, it is still dark when I reach to shut off the Holstein shaped alarm clock that my best friend, Jesse gave me for my 16th birthday. To shut it off, you have to pull down on the cow's enormous plastic udder. Mom wanted to throw it out. I told her it was just humor, Jesse style. I step into the steamy shower and let the warmth coax me awake. I shampoo, shave my legs, and let the conditioner sit in my hair for exactly five minutes, just as it says on the bottle. After toweling off, I put on deodorant, foot powder, perfume, and then begin applying wine-colored eyeliner under my lashes. Do boys have to go through this trouble day in and day out? How about Tomper Sandell, the football player who appears to be naturally cute with his shaggy blonde hair and cleft chin? Does he worry about how he smells? I put on extra eyeshadow in a semicircle around my top eyelid. According to Glamour magazine, this will give oriental eyes a look of depth. I've always known that I don't have that neat crease at the top of my lid, like my friends do, that tells you exactly where the eyeshadow should stop. So every day I have to paint in that crease, but I don't think I'm fooling anyone. Hurry up, Ellen. Mom calls from downstairs. I throw on my new Ocean Pacific t-shirt and jeans and run down. Mom is standing in the kitchen, quietly spreading peanut butter on whole wheat bread. She turns to look at me and her eyebrows dip into a slight frown. Is that what you're wearing to school? Yes, mom, I say. We go through this scene every year. What about all those good clothes we bought in Minneapolis? Those dresses are great, I say, but nobody wears a dress on the first day of school. Oh, mom says, as if she's not convinced. She turns to finish packing my lunch. As usual, father has already left for the hospital so he could get an early start on patients with morning empty, surgery ready stomachs. Goodbye, Myung Oak. It's your last year here, she says. I look up at her upon hearing my Korean name. To me, it doesn't sound like my name, but to mom, I think it means something special. Sometimes I think she has so much more to say to me, but it gets lost, partly because of the gap separating Korean and English, and partly because of some other kind of gap that has always existed between me and my parents. Here's just a little bit from chapter two. It is dinner time at the Song household. And although she's absent, the presence of my sister still dominates. She was very disciplined, father says, as he began slurping his Korean soup. Even when she was getting all A's, she still studied hard because she knew that being at the top of her class at a public school like Arkin wouldn't guarantee her getting into Harvard. I tense my back against my chair. What good will it do for everyone to keep parading all of Michelle's accomplishments in front of me? Today in calculus class, Mr. Carlson, the teacher, delightedly shambled over when he saw me. How's Michelle doing? Was the first thing that popped out of his mouth. Boy, she was a whiz at math, was the second. I sat there wondering if he knew what my name was. I look down at my lasagna. It's tomatoey, garlicky smell mingles with the smell of seaweed from father's soup. Since mom has always cooked something Korean for father and something American for her, Michelle, and me, the smells are always clashing, usually ending up in weird cloying odors. 
How is school today? Mom asks. Okay, not much new, I say. Although there's so much I want to say that I wish I could say that I can't. I mentally close my eyes and envision a different conversation. A boy called me a chink on the bus today, I would say. Mom's mouth would open. Father's chopsticks would drop, sinking unnoticed into the murky depths of his soup. You poor thing, Mom would say. What did you do? I totally ignored him, I would answer confidently. How terrible to have to go through that, Father would say. And he'd take off his thick spectacles so that for once I could see the tenderness in his eyes. With all this stress, I think Ellen should worry less about grades and more about having a fun senior year and making friends, Mom would add. I agree, Father would say, and he'd resume slurping his soup. Slurp. Slurp. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Marie, for reading that. Uh, you know, I'm an East Coast kind of guy. I've always lived in uh, New York or New Jersey, a tri-state area. And the Midwest is kind of this exotic kind of place to me. Um, and, and when I went there, you know, it's, it's like, you know, I have a cheese eating contest every meal just to feel like what it's like. Marie's uh, Finding My Voice is this incredible story. It's kind of like breaking away, but with Asians, you know. Okay, so uh, I'm going to read a little bit from David Tan, Can't Have a Girlfriend Until He Gets Into an Ivy League College. Um, I don't have like the really pretty, shiny copy that uh, Neela has. I only have this ugly, uncorrected proof. Um, one thing you should know is that uh, there's, there's a mention of Harmony Health, which is a hospital internship that David Tung has applied to. Um, and now, even though he's been told that he can't have a girlfriend and he can't date, he is forced to have to ask his mother for help in renting a tux because he's planning on going to this dance. Okay, here we go. My heart was pounding in fear when my mother picked me up as usual at the bus stop. I was full on terrified to lay out all my plans in full, which I needed to do even to have a shot at her giving me the tux money. How was school? She asked. Fine, I said. I saw her mouth twitch. She was suspicious when she didn't hear grades. No tests or quizzes? No, uh, nothing today. What about Harmony Health? Still nothing. Whenever I didn't have a clear marker of success to report to her, she liked to go fishing for a deficiency. When are you going to hear? Soon, I, I think. We rode in silence a little bit. I couldn't tell if she was in a good or bad mood, but I figured I could go fishing too. Mom? Yes? Do you think every Saturday night is going to be busy at Tongue's Garden? She actually laughed. Hope so. Don't you hope so too, David? Yeah, I, I guess. I couldn't muster the courage to bring up the dance. Once we got to the restaurant, I went into work mode. Every time I thought I was going to get a break for a few minutes, another task presented itself. Soon the night was almost over. We were cleaning up. It was now or never. I'd already decided that there was no way I was going to tell my mother about the dance once we got home. She said numerous times that when she gets home, she just wants to sleep. Plus, here at the restaurant, there was always the chance I could rally up some backup support from Auntie Dong or my dad. At the very least, my mother would think twice before really lashing into me. If it came to that, my newly found level of social acceptance and the potential for a real life girlfriend was riding on being able to go to the dance. I could be as cool at Shark Beach High as I was at the Chinese school in Chinatown. But in order for that to happen, I needed to go to Nordstrom this week. There was no way to put it off any longer. Mom, I said hoarsely. She was stapling receipts near the cash register. Yes? Can you help me rent a tuxedo? Tuxedo? What for? 
I want to go to a school dance. She put down the stapler and curled her hands in a fist. You want to go to a dance? My shoulders shrugged out of fear. A girl asked me to go and I said, yes. A girl, said my mother, like a TV detective announcing she'd found the murder weapon. I heard my father moving somewhere behind me, possibly taking shelter. Who's this girl? Christina Tao. My mother flared her nostrils. Is she your secret girlfriend, David? No, I said. I don't have a girlfriend, much less a secret girlfriend. Tao, she said venomously. It sounds like a Cantonese name. My mother sometimes expressed distaste for Cantonese people for no explicable reason. How many times have I told you? You're not allowed to have a girlfriend until college. You better get into an Ivy League school. It was the end of yet another long day of work, but my mother didn't seem tired at all. She was as mad as I've ever seen her. You said that enough times, I said. I looked around for more, some silent show of support. Auntie Zong's English wasn't great, but she could probably understand what was happening. Yet she was diligently wiping down a tabletop, her head bent. My father suddenly found that something in the kitchen required him. After a brief pause, my mother was on me again. You're not even number one, are you? She pointed at my nose. All the way down at number eight. You spent too much time thinking about girls. That was a complete lie. It angered me into a fatal mistake, talking back to my mother while she was still fired up. I spent too much time working at this restaurant. You know how long I work here? How long your father works here? You wanna run around with girls while we're spending day and night here making money so we can live? Oh no, don't let her start talking about money when she's this angry. O okay, look, I said, attempting to calm her down. It it's, it's just one dance, it's not a big deal. Christina's parents are Chinese too and they think it's okay. But there was no calm eye to this storm. They're not your parents and that's not my child. Why can't you understand? No, you don't understand. Actually, I truly didn't. A lot of kids are going. Not you, David, my mother thundered. You tell this girl you don't want a girlfriend and you don't want to talk to her anymore. I already told her I would go, I said. Tell her you can't. You're in school and school is for learning, not for girls. She closed her lips and wiped her front teeth with her tongue, considering something. Give me your phone, David. What? Give me your phone. I don't want you talking and sexting with this girl. I'm not sexting with her, Mom. Who knows what you're doing? I handed over my phone, and half a second later, it was zipped up in her purse. Nothing ever escaped from there, not even life. Thank you so much. Thank you both so much. That was so great to hear. Um, and thank you for speaking with me, Anna Marie. Um, I respect and love both your work so much, um, your contributions to the Asian American literary canon. Um, and thank you so much to the Brooklyn Book Festival, Puniman and Kaya. These are literary organizations that I've been following and admiring forever, as well as AEWW, which is actually the first place I've ever, I ever interned at a few years ago. So it feels extra special nice. to be part of this event <laughs> and work with people who've been continuously kind and generous to me since my time there. Um, and thank you to Lily, Tiffany, Rob, and Yellow for arranging this. Um, yeah, and I'm so excited to be part of the commencement um, event of the David Tung book tour. Um, so Ed, since this is your YA debut, I'm wondering if you could talk about the transition from writing for adults to writing for younger people, or if that was even a conscious choice. Um, and I guess just overall inspirations that you had or what you were thinking about um, before and during writing this book. You know, I never really have um, an audience of mine when I'm writing. I just try to write to me, you know. Um, and uh, I mean, in the course of writing about like uh, Chinatown mysteries uh, and then moving on to Taiwan, that was because 
I was, you know, in the research of like doing, you know, looking into the history of Chinatown, I started to, you know, question my own family's personal history. And like that led to Taiwan, of course. Um, and my father's like a long time from a long line of uh, Taiwanese settlers. Like they, they, you know, there have been waves of people who emigrated from China to Taiwan um, over millennia. And his family came over when the Ming dynasty collapsed in the 1600s. Um, yeah, but in, in the course of all that research and, and making things more personal, I, I kind of thought about like the YA books that were out there. And I feel like none of them really spoke to the, the terror that I had, um, you know, being in high school and just being really, really scared that, you know, my grades weren't good enough. Uh, my SAT score wasn't high enough to achieve, you know. Um, you know, really, uh, a lot of uh, second generation Asian Americans are just proxies for their parents battling with their uh, other relatives and friends uh, because like they only got so far because of a glass ceiling, but my kid is gonna beat your kid. Uh, my kid's gonna play piano better and is gonna go to Harvard and then he's gonna play for the Knicks, undrafted, you know. <laughs> But um, I, I always thought about writing for me. I mean, these, all, all these books are really for me. Um, and I guess when I'm thinking about writing for a younger me, um, I, I had fewer reservations and uh, really, really wanted to push things because I was being squeezed so hard in this box, you know? Um, I mean, like grades were just absolute, you know, it wasn't like, how was your day? It's like, show me your grade and then I'll tell you how your day was. And, and this whole thing about being pushed uh, for a certain demographic of Asian Americans uh, into getting everything being reduced to a grade, it's almost kind of anti-learning. It's like you're thinking about how, how to get the highest GPA rather than actually really taking in something and learning it or even really loving to learn things. And then you kind of are unable to figure out what you enjoy learning about, what your favorite subjects are. Um, you know, it, it's been said that uh, not by, I'm not the originator of this, but uh, Asian Americans, when they hit college, they're usually like a double major or a major and a minor because one is for their parents and the other thing is for them. And I, I was totally that. I was. I was a, a double major. I was mining engineering and literature writing. And I was one class short with a literature writing degree. I didn't finish. I love that. Um, thank you. And I guess um, kind of going into uh, talking about like being squeezed out of a box, um, both of your books, um, David Tung and Finding My Voice, talk about. Um, something that I, when Finding My Voice was first published, um, the uh, young adult Asian American literature landscape, which wasn't as vast. So I'm also wondering, Marie, like what you were thinking about or reading um, when you're writing that. And I guess I want to also know both your thoughts on the current uh, mainstream of novels that are, that highlight the Asian American youth love stories um, with Netflix picking up a bunch of adaptations of books. Um, yeah, just wanted to know what your thoughts. I have to say, I'm so excited that there are so many wonderful YA authors now, you know, like Mary H.K. Choi or Jenny Han or David Yoon. I mean, there's just, um, there's a plethora that just makes me feel so happy. And I'm so happy about Ed's book too, because I've always had librarians going, oh, all the boys love your book, but they all sneak it out. They want a book about boys and they won't, they don't like having the girl on the cover. And, you know, I understand, you know, like the peer pressure. And so this is so welcome. Um, and it's kind of, as I mentioned, my book went in and out of print so many times and that's not even half of it. I think part of it was, you know, I grew up in a really small town in Minnesota. Like my town was so small, we would have not had a Nordstrom's. If we had a county seat, was where people shopped, but it was not in our town. It was in Duluth, which is actually where Trump just was. You'd have to drive 70 miles. Like it was a very, 
you know, I just grew up in a very sort of um, uh, very small mining town and I never had any Asian American books. Uh, the closest I ever got was finding Farewell to Manzanar in the library to sing an Asian person. And then I realized that book was written by her. So I just read a lot of, I read a lot of Judy Bloom. Um, I read a lot of adult books, you know, like Thomas Hardy. Um, and Essie Hinton was a favorite, but I didn't have anything to even aspire to, which was what made it so difficult. And then also like Ed was talking about, I, dro I dropped out of pre-med. My parents are Korean War refugees. You know, they couldn't even conceive of wanting to be a writer. So it's like, no, you're gonna be a doctor, you're gonna be a doctor. And I couldn't be a doctor because I flunked out of, I flunked out of like Argo for a semester. But then, you know, I, I majored in econ and I was gonna go work in finance. My parents were all very excited. That was sort of my plan. So I could also, you know, I could take some writing and some really cool religious studies classes or other things that I liked. Um, but then, so when I was working at Goldman and just, you know, trying to make money and trying to hope someday I could have somewhat of a sustainable career, I still didn't know like how you get published or how anything works. And when I was first started, when I, when I wrote Finding My Voice, I didn't know it was even a YA book. Like I didn't even know that there were different categories. I just thought, you know, I started in college. So you kind of just write what you know a little bit. And so I, you know, I was in college. So I wrote about my, like about high school. And so when I started sending it out, I would get the weirdest replies from people. Oh, we already had a book about Cambodia last year, you know, and it would be by a white woman. And I just kept kind of going, what's going on? And my big break really was the reason I majored in econ is because I had a plan. I actually had a plan that I was going to live in New York, but I need to live by myself. So if I was going to do that, I had to have a job where it paid me a lot of money. So I did that. And then, um, my boyfriend, who's now my husband, worked at a publishing company. And so he, we used to get to go to all these publishing things for free. And Judy Bloom was at a pen, um, like gala or something that we went to. So I was like, ha look at my book, look at my book. And I cannot believe I did this. I said, Judy Bloom, oh my God, you know, I love you so much. And she's all, she was so nice. And then she goes, she said, oh, do you like to write? And I said, oh yeah, by the way, you know, I have a book. I just wrote a YA book, blah, blah, blah. Do you want to see it? And to my utter surprise, she said, yes. And so the world's craziest story is I sent her some of it and she really liked it. Um, she did not, get, she gave it to her agent who did not like it as much, but her agent sent it to a junior agent. And because of this fairy godmother thing, after all the, oh, we already have a book about Cambodia. Even after that though, um, it got rejected by 22 publishers. Everyone saying, oh, we already had an Asian book. And they were all talking about books that were written about Asia and the last publisher was Houghton Mifflin, for which my agent said, okay, dude, it's this one. And if not, we're done. And they'd already held on to it for months. So I was already going like, oh my God. And by then my money had run out and I was freelancing for a different investment bank. And I just, but I just wanted to be a writer so bad. And I was like, I couldn't think about doing anything else. And then I got this little call saying um, they wanted the book. And by then I'd actually written, if it hadn't been for you and June, my middle grade book, because it took so long to get this first one published. And so that was kind of, the super improbable way that my career started. And it was so close to having never started that I can never forget the gratitude I have for everybody who helped, um, including later when the book actually came out, there was someone from the Japanese American Curricular Project who liked it and she kind of like sent it to all these people and these academics. And it's because of that, that the book has had life. And so I never forget, Never, I never take any of this for granted and I'm just, ecstatic that the book is coming out again. And then I'm writing YA again. I haven't written YA since 1996. So I'm kind of, yeah, getting back into it. Yeah, great. And um, what about you, Ed, on um, the current landscape of all this, um, yeah, the mainstream Asian American uh, young people stories? Uh certainly seems to be a lot of it right um but you know i i, I grew up uh you know i'm a, a punk rock kid i'm really into really subversive kind of things and um as there are more asian pacific american things it's kind of like it's kind of becoming like kind of mainstream kind of like when husker du signed with warner brothers <laughs> I'm just showing my age here, you know, um, but I, I remember 
it was it was a really big deal because like you know the punk rock ethos is something that you really hold on to and it's just like about the love for the music and the energy in the community and not you know making it like a a, a career and money kind of thing um uh, bob mold the singer guitarist of who's good do actually wrote this letter uh to this punk widely distributed punk fanzine like explaining how you know we haven't sold out we're just trying to get better distribution for our music so that you can actually get it you know we were on the smaller label and you guys would always write into us and tell us you couldn't find a record but now you can so um i don't know I, it's it's really cool um and one of the things that malcolm x pointed to was that the country, the, the Americans' perceptions of its black population was also rooted in its uh, perception of Africa as well. And that you needed to, to unite the diaspora with the, the motherland in a way. And uh, I gotta say, you know, when Parasite won the Academy, Academy Award Best Film, it was like, yes, like that was like for us, you know? Um, and, and just seeing the stage flood with Asians to claim that award was like awesome. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and I guess um, I have a question about um, channeling that time in your life, um, which I think every immigrant child can relate to of basically balancing um, and living two lives, growing up in a household that abides by the culture they're from and attending school where the racial or socioeconomic background isn't considered the norm. Um, and also in David Tung's case, um, and, and another, like another life of like running away to New York and his like punk rock moment, <laughs> growing up in <laughs> town kids. So yeah, I'm just wondering about, um, yeah, like, balancing those things, um, yeah. I think one of the things that was great about uh, being in the writer's workshop, and I was a co-founder, but Ed actually joined really early on too, was probably, um, so it was not only were we all ex-pre-meds or ex-engineers, actually I think Ed, you were probably the only non-pre-med, I think we were all ex-pre-meds. But it was, but so much of it, and so many people were coming out. They were like, what was the worst thing? Coming out or being coming out as a writer? There were so many parental problems that we had that will, that kind of gave us this kind of solidarity. But I think within so much of that too is that our own appreciation of our crazy parents and the stuff that they did, so that we could get to this point and have these kind of different jobs or being writers. So I think um, what Curtis, our founder, used to say, and it was kind of sweet because um, so I was the only person who actually had a book contract when we started the Writers Workshop. So everyone's always like, eh, that book. And he, and he said it's, and it was kind of like for all of us, we were just like finding our voice. Like that was kind of our way of trying to find our way as writers, as writing the stuff we wanted to write. And I'm, I'll back up a little bit. Like Amy Tan was sort of the omnipresent writer or the one that every white person responded to at that time. And it was kind of, she had this kind of dominance. I'm not saying um, that's bad or that her writing is bad, but she had such a dominance in terms of the mainstream marketplace that we were responding to in a way that we all felt sort of oppressed by. Well, because almost everybody, almost all of us at some point had someone say to us, why don't you write more like Amy Tan? Why don't you write about your grandma? Where's the rice? La, la, la. And so we just wanted to write the, whatever weird stuff we want to write, like maybe stuff with, that didn't have Asians in it. And so that kind of solidarity, um, because, uh, you know, frankly, it was a lot of work to get the workshop going and all of us are finally published, but we probably have lost at least a book or two given the work that we put into the workshop. But at the same time, that was probably like the most fabulous time in my twenties. Um, you know, we're all still really good friends and we're all so supportive of each other. And it's just been amazing to be able to watch this evolve. And that, so it's kind of like, I'm finally, I feeling like the metaphor of trying to love your parents and honor them, but also do your own thing was also kind of the metaphor we had at the workshop because we didn't always get along. <laughs> we, had, we had different ideas. And so forth. we fought a lot, but we laughed a lot. And so to some degree, 
Um, like what Ed was saying, like the pride you feel like seeing Parasite is kind of a similar pride that we see with this efflorescence of like YA, like Asian American YA. Like it doesn't have to be like one person anymore. It's more that there's so many voices and that's all that we wanted. We didn't want, oh, this person wrote the YA to end all YA. We just want there to be more voices and there are. And that's what's making me so happy. Yeah, the, the early days of the writer's workshop were, um, were incredible because it, it literally was a writing workshop. You would bring in your work and it'd be like this one big kind of workshop. But apart from that, Curtis also got the APA journal off the ground because yeah. he knew that, you know, getting that first poem or first story published anywhere was like a huge leg up, you know, um, considering the outlets that were available back then. I mean, I mean, you, you think there aren't a lot of uh, BIPOC editors now? <laughs> like back then, it was like... <laughs> yeah, we couldn't get anyone to say boo to us because there was actually a big Asian American anthology that came out and of course, none of us were in it. So we we're all right in it. Right in it. And then we thought, we're going to make our own anthology. So why not? I mean, do you know what I'm saying? So... <laughs> there is a kind of weird punk aesthetic, even though we were all nerdy about it, if you think about it. I mean, oh there was no Asian American bookstore, so we had the lar we had what we yes. call the largest Asian American bookstore in the nation, because we were the only one, so yeah. we were definitely <laughs> the largest. Do you, do you remember um, the summer of 92, we went on that trip to Atlantic City? Oh, I was not on that trip. Oh, gosh. That was, was the caravan? <laughs> Yeah, but okay, it was so, okay, Curtis, like, we go into a casino, because, like, you know, you, how can you not? But, like, <laughs> on the third quarter, Curtis put into the slot machine, it just paid off, and, like. No way. Yeah, totally, like, two buckets of, like, quarters came out, and it was like, whoa! <laughs> like, he, he put a bucket on the machine, and it, it filled up, and he had to throw another one under there. It was crazy. But it was like, exactly. it just represented the bounty coming in. Right. You know, <laughs> for paying our dues early on. <laughs> well, Curtis, by the way, is a filmmaker now. He's uh, done this incredible, he's done incredible documentaries. Uh, the first one was called Vincent Who, uh, which is about how the, the memory of Vincent Chin and the events surrounding his murder have been forgotten, even after this landmark documentary, Who Killed Vincent Chin, uh, was made. Um, and the second one was called Tested, which is about the Shasat in New York City, um, which is the, the, the one uh, determination th that you take in, in order to get into the special, uh, the special schools in the New York City system. Fantastic films. They are. And you'll laugh, actually. We, um, I'm in a new writer's group with them, and we're all Asian Americans. It's actually kind of random. It's a pandemic writer's group. We do it on Zoom. <laughs> so it's almost like we just can't help ourselves. It's with different people, but it's an Asian American writer's group on Zoom. And he does have a wonderful uh, memoir that we've just read, and it's going to be amazing when it comes out. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. He's like David Tung because his family had a restaurant. Oh, it's, it's exactly. The book is a, a um, it reminded me a lot of your book, so I was almost, I read a little of your book so I wouldn't get the two mixed up, <laughs> because we just read it in manuscript. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And like, I, I didn't grow, we didn't have a, a restaurant, but we had a hotel. And hotels like 24-7 24 business. So like, someone always had to be, you know, watching the office. And uh, at a pretty early age, I think like, man, I must have been like 12. I mean, I would watch the office on the weekends, like, nine to like two three in the morning but like i got to see all the the early saturday night lives and stuff oh, wow. and the twilight zone um yeah i remember the andy kaufman skits on snl were just insane and wonderful were you by yourself? So you were just like work, no child labor laws. You were like working by yourself. Child like labor. <laughs> man, if there were child labor laws enforced, all, every Asian American business would shut down. Like, you know, you, you walk into like a Asian, you know, mom and pop business. Like there's always like a kid like standing there with like a 50 yard stare. <laughs> I love hearing all the 
early AWW history anecdotes because before we were, when we were doing this tech rehearsal, we, I was just laughing at all of it and Marie's stories about it. Um, yeah, and I guess um, shifting from channeling, like living the two lives, um, big aspect of both your books are um, Asian American study culture. So I'm wondering how um, now as parents and also writers who are reflecting on that time with uh, college admissions, like competition and um, um, yeah, like all the things of immigrant parent expectations. Um, I'm wondering like how that's evolved, how that was, yeah, and going back to that time and writing about the pressures of that. I think what was different for me than Ed is that my, we lived in an all white area, so we didn't have the competition. That's what I really liked about your book is the, like the sort of side eyeing competition and then also sort of, you know, in a lot of YA books, like the rich, handsome person is generally the good person because that reflects that, but it's kind of like you have all these, this universe of Asian Americans and this sort of cutthroat of that culture. So for me though, too, just sort of looking back on it, I'm kind of amazed that my parents were immigrants and then we lived in a town where 60% uh, of people did not go to college. And of, the, of that very small amount, people just went to state schools, like nobody went to Harvard. But because my father went to Seoul National University, which is like the Harvard of Korea. And in Korea, it's less, oh, you can bribe your way in or, you know, do weird class, you know, do weird extracurriculars in Korea. It's like, you take the test. Did you pass? It, it doesn't matter who you are. In some ways, it's more of a meritocracy. And so my, you know, that's all my dad had to go with. And so I just remember really dumb things like in, um, all my friends are taking typing class. My dad be like, no, you have to take German. Like we only had one language thing. And I just like, no, all my friends are taking typing. He's like, yeah, you cannot do that. And he would give us extra homework. I never got to see Jaws because my friends went to see Jaws and I had to stay in and do a book report. Like obviously at the time as a kid, you find that so oppressive and you think your parents are crazy or just adds uh, the dialogue. All the other kids are doing it. Well, you're not gonna do it. Like, I don't know how many times I've heard that because I just feel like my parents are crazy. Like any normal parent lets her kid go out and do things. And I just wanted to go out and like have a, go to a party. But now, you know, as, as a parent, exactly. I just kind of see, wow. I feel also very lucky because, you know, when I, I teach at Columbia and when I see these students and how professional they are about how they got in and the things they did, I thought, oh my God, I didn't know anything. I probably wouldn't get in today. And so, you know, my parent, my father's passed away, but I have such a deep gratitude for despite like not really know what he, knowing what he was doing in terms of, you know what I mean? Like none of his friends had kids who were going to go to an Ivy League school or anything, like just feeling like this was going to be the way that I, that his kids were gonna succeed. And that was just, he also, I know that because my parents, when they first came here, they were in Jim Crow, Alabama. And I know that that experience affected them very deeply in terms of coming from a homogenous country and then being stuck in Jim Crow. I know that affected them very deeply in terms of they didn't let us do anything Asian. Like we weren't allowed to learn Korean, no Korean food. They were so afraid of it all the time. Um, I know that that came from a place of love and them wanting us to succeed and so I just have so much more of an expansive, like loving look at it, even though it, recalling it to write about it and what it, in these novels is all about how horrible or how, how hard, you know, how hard it is when you're a kid and you're already different and you're not allowed to be like the other kids. I think that's, that's kind of what's at the core of a lot of Asian American YA is you're already different and you're not allowed to be like the other kids. And that's, it's hard. Like even if it comes from a place of love, it's difficult. You know, I, I was born in, in New York City, but we moved to uh, Jersey when I was like three. And so I grew up in these uh, different towns in Jersey where there was like this kind of like, you know, friendly-ish racism, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> uh, like a few towns that we lived in had, you know, maybe like 10% Asian and there were enough 
people of Chinese descent to actually have a Chinese school. But um, the, the places that I lived in the longest uh, didn't really. Um, and so it, I, you know, I, I went from this environment, a sort of friendly-ish racism to, uh, we, we moved the summer before my senior year uh, into this really small town in Pennsylvania. Um, and like, it was like, that was like straight up racism. I was like, um, I remember I took a, a wrong turn once uh, on this mountain road and I was in front of this house and it had a lynched gorilla costume in the front yard. And I was like, man, I gotta get out of this town. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, your upbringing in the sense that like, you know, from, from freshman year to senior year, uh, I mean like 40, 45% dropout rate. Um, and then, you know, very few people going on to four year colleges uh, after that. Um, I remember like my, my first days at this school in Pennsylvania, like kids, you know, there were of course the racist kids, but like some kids who empathized with me were just like, you know, there's a local clan chapter here. And I'm like, what? And they're like, yeah, so-and-so's dad is like the editor of the newsletter. I'm like, they have a newsletter? <laughs> Um, so, uh, so I went from this environment and I was like, okay, okay. You know, when I get to college, man, I'm totally going to be in this like Asian American, you know, group and we're going to be like fighting racism and stuff. And then, so, you know, I got into Columbia and like during orientation, it was like, whoa, you know, cause it was like, I was like this hick coming in talking about like, uh, you know, fighting racism and like, there were all these other kids who came from very prosperous backgrounds who were like, you know, had fake IDs to get in the clubs and everything. And so uh, I actually took a bit from that experience and pulled it into high school for, for David Tung. Um, the Jersey that I grew up in didn't have that many Asians, but now like Northern Jersey, there are towns that are majority Asian. There's, um, there's some town, I think it's in Bergen County, that's like 60% Korean. Isn't that wild? I'm from there, so. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Nice. I'm guessing it's Palisades Park? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So like, it uh -huh. must be nice because you can get the food like so easily. But then also, it's like everybody knows each other's business and like, you know, you're the neighbor down the block probably knows what you got on the biology quiz. <laughs> yeah, it was very much like that. <laughs> okay, um, and I guess for my last question, um, so what I love about both these novels is that they're driven by the first person perspective and are led by really powerful, smart, like, quippy young voices. And you both are foundational to the workshop's existence. So for my last question, I'm wondering what it's like for you to reflect on finding and coming to these strong voices for your stories um, back when, yeah, you're just showing up with something you just wrote, uh, St. Mark's or Chinatown or wherever <laughs> the workshop was at the time. That was a good time actually to just write for no reason. I do have to mention that that was the best thing about the workshop is that we just did it for no reason. We never wanted to get published, but to your question, I am so happy that you asked this because I love telling the story. So when I did have the agent and she was striking out everywhere, uh, the Cambodian books, blah, 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 like close, we love the writing, ah, this very famous editor said, okay, I'm kind of interested in this book, but the first person present tense is very amateurish. You need to write it like a third person past tense because first person present tense, super amateurish, like that. So I was kind of like, oh my God, she's so famous. So I'm trying to rewrite it in third person, like past tense. And I'm kind of like, you know what? You know, I never, you know, like I majored in econ. I never really actually even took writing classes. So I don't like, I'm just barely learning like different structural techniques. So I didn't even really understand about voice. But what I did understand is I wanted this book to help the reader feel what it's like to be called chink, basically. And there's no way to do that, not doing it in first person present tense. 
So I was kind of crying. I wrote back to her. I said, no, I can't do it. And so if I hadn't gotten the book published, I probably would have had a very bitter. um, So I'm not saying like there's a magic formula, but at the same time, I am saying that the book is the book that I wanted to write the way I wanted to write it, despite the very strong feeling that this white editor had for how it should be. So, you know, like what Ed was saying earlier is like, you got to just do what you're going to do. And, you know, now whatever, 20, whatever years later, I'm so happy for this book. And I don't think if I would have done that even, and it would have come out with this big press, I don't know if I would still love it as much. That's what I'm going to say. So that's, that's how I came to that voice because that's how I heard the voice. And then when I looked at it more critically, that's the voice that I wanted. So thank you so much for asking that. Of course. Thank you. You know, I, I'm like you, Bri. I, I don't have an MFA. Um, I didn't go to graduate school for, uh, for writing, you know. Uh, I only took a few writing classes uh, while I was an undergrad. And of course, the, the, I consider the writer's workshop to be, you know, almost an MFA-ish ex- yeah. experience in, in a way. Um, so, I don't know. I, I just remember, you know, early 90s, you know, getting these... <laughs> You know, re- reading these books about how to write, you know, <laughs> how to write. Um, and, um, and I was just like, wow, this is really not working. This is like, you know, uh, almost picking like a, a tabs book at like how to play Stairway to Heaven solo or something. So I just kind of feel that my writing and everybody's writing really is like a unique kind of instrument. And you just got to learn to, to play it well. And um, if this doesn't go to people who are like high up editors or anything, it's, that's fine. I mean, most people don't read books, so oh, you, you might as well appeal to them. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so now we have some questions from the audience. Um, first one from Hyunjung Kim. What prompted you to write for and or about Asian American youth? And thank you so much for doing so. This is so exciting. I didn't have anything like this growing up. It's amazing to hear these readings. You go. <laughs> okay, well, uh, Viet Nguyen has said that every war is fought twice, once in actuality and then in, uh, in the retelling of it. But, uh, you know, so I'm still fighting my Asian American childhood uh, by, you know, <laughs> by in, in a fictional kind of sense. Um, and uh, part of me is still stuck there, honestly. It's okay. It's okay. We, we have different strata to our experiences. And your book is super funny, too, by the way. I think humor is very underrated in terms of as a literary quality. And my answer is very simple you know what, I just wanted to have an Asian American book so bad when I was growing up, so I just had to write it. That's, that, that's basically what I did. Amazing, okay. Um, so question two from Haley Huang. Both of you wrote books about the Asian American experience in the US. I'm very interested to know how you both came up with the titles to your novels. Was it your title or did the publishers have opinions about what it should be? David Tong is the best title. Who came up with that? Um, I, I came up with it because I was just like, God, okay, so it's about this and this and this. And it can't be like, uh, <laughs> I don't know, the long run or something, you know? It's like, because like there, there aren't a lot of Asian American titles that are like, Bruh! everyone's like, you know, concerned about, you know, how they'll come off. Uh, maybe a bit too concerned about their appearances or anything, you know, I, I look at me, you know, I, I'm, I'm a guy who just like, you know, I just throw the pizza against the wall. That's it. The title tells you everything you need to know, basically. It, it's a log line, you know. Yeah. No, it's good. I agree. Uh, because some, you know what I mean? There's always like that super literary book with a super long title. So we should have a one too, like that sort of the David Eggers kind of title. And I came up, I came up with Finding My Voice. Um, it was originally going to be called Greetings from Ark and Min, because one of the first images I had when I was writing it was of a postcard. 
and that was called that for a really long time. But then um, I think the heart of it really, I think I wanted it to be more emotional to the heart of what the book was about. So I, I did come up with that title as well. Doesn't Ark and Min sound Korean? No, you never put an R and a K together in Korean. Min. Ark. <laughs> I think it was, um, you know, what's funny is um, my friend Cheryl Strayed is from a town nearby. It's called Aiken. I tend to do this when I'm making stuff up. I'll just change one letter because I'm so lazy. So I think I took Aiken and put an R in it. <laughs> Aiken has even fewer people than Hibbing. So. Uh, and this is wild. I, I've known Haley since the 90s as well. Ooh, Shout out to Haley. Nice. <laughs> okay. Um... Our next question is from Leland Tavares, and this is for Ed. During this discussion, we have discussed the ways that Asian Americans tend to be put into certain social boxes, often due to stereotyping, that can risk presenting somewhat linear narratives of Asian Americanness. In a similar way, genre fiction, like detective crime fiction and high school coming of age fiction, operates through fixed conventions, but your books also work through and against such conventions. So what possibilities does genre fiction provide for expanding cultural narratives of Asian Americanness? Or since we're talking about punk's resistance possibilities, how can we punk genre? Punk <laughs> being used as a verb here. And thanks so much everyone for your time. I also love this question. <laughs> okay, well, uh, because of the pandemic, we can no longer have conventions. So I urge everyone to ditch them. Um, the, the whole thing about the, the books that are published cue to a certain linear kind of thing is because the publishing industry naturally is not going to publish a book that they think is going to lose money. They want to reduce the odds as much as possible. Um, so by having comps, you know, comparable books that you can sort of glom onto it uh, makes a book more publishable uh, as opposed to something being more original. But I urge everyone to not only uh, write more originally, but to support work out there that is original as well. And like to, to, to drive that wedge and, and like widen it a little bit. Um, hmm. What else can I say? Uh, listen to more punk rock. Uh, check out Soul Glow out of Philadelphia. They are like the, one of the best new bands out there. And they're on Bandcamp. Mm. And today's Friday. And Bandcamp has uh, suspended taking royalties. So anything you buy on Bandcamp goes directly to the band today. Mm -hmm. Love that. Okay, and then uh, this is from Patty Jones. What advice would you give to new and aspiring Asian American writers who are trying to break into the industry? Right. Great, yeah. <laughs> All right, and then from Jay uh, Rantawa, I'm curious if Ed and Marie could speak to craft challenges they face when writing Finding My Voice and David Tan and what they learned from their characters. You should go, Ed. I already talked about my voice problem. Um, let's see. Uh, it's true that there is a a slant to YA being geared towards girls and young female protagonists uh, and writers as well. Um, you know, I remember reading, um, what is that? The, the Sherman Alexi YA book, um, Half Indian, fake, fake book from a half Indian? Oh my gosh, like I, that. Yeah, that title's also so big. <laughs> yeah, that, that's also a great title too. So yeah. I can't like rattle it off. But um, that for me, that was really striking too, because there's a real, you know, when, when you're a, a boy and growing into your young manhood, there's always a physicality to it. Like not necessarily like fighting, but just like, you know, banging up against people and stuff. Um, it's, you know, you, you take your bruises. Um, Let's see. So what, what are you supposed to learn from David Tung? I don't know if you can learn anything apart from that you're not alone and that a lot of people are going through what you are going through, no matter how, uh, how alone uh, and lost that you feel. There's someone 
or at least more than someone uh, going through exactly what uh, you go through. Uh, oh, I'd also like to point out that uh, I really dig this artist, this alternative hip hop artist called O Young, and his stuff mm -hmm. is on Bandcamp as well. So mm -hmm. definitely give a listen and support. Yes, O oh, Young. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and then we have a question from Haley Fong. How long did it take each of you to get your first book published? Uh, mine was 10 years. Uh, I don't know, like, wh what's the starting point? Like the first day you started writing or the first day you tried getting an agent or the first day that agent started sending it out? <laughs> um, I don't know, maybe I guess from writing the book or finishing that final draft, maybe. You know, it's often said that a, a writer's first published book isn't the first one they've written. Usually it's like the second or third one. For me, that's definitely true. Um, well, I have this really horrible, horrible book that I think is on a floppy disk somewhere. Um, I think I reached page 70 and I was like, wow, this book is so bad. You know, if, if it's like this painful to keep writing it, how painful is it going to be to read this thing? Um, and so I, you know, I just printed out the whole thing and put it in a drawer somewhere. Um, and then uh, my cousin, who grew up a lot like me, uh, working at a hotel, at his family's uh, hotel, he killed himself. And that kind of spurred me on to like look at my own young childhood at this hotel. Um, and I wrote this book relatively quickly, like in like seven months or so. It's, wow. it's a really short book. Wow. It's called Waylaid, and it, that became my first book. And that book was published by Kaya because I met Sun Young Lee who spoke at a panel at the Writer's Workshop called How to Get Your Book Published. <laughs> yeah. So after I, I was like, hey, uh, I've, I've written this crazy book. You want to see it? And she's like, okay, sure. So I sent her this book. You know, I printed it out and like mailed it to her. Uh, and then like a few weeks later, I get this book back in the mail. And it's like, you know, I'm going through the page, it's like bleeding. There's like, you know, comments and like slashes all throughout it. And I was like, oh, oh. And like just feeling all, all the pain. And, and I like shoved it in a drawer. And then she called me like a few weeks later and was like, hey, so what do you think? I'm like, what, what do I think? You know, you, you hate the book. And she's like, no, we love it. We want to publish it. I was like, what? That's great. So um, I guess going back to the person who asked about breaking into writing, uh, I, I would say have a really thick skin. Don't they take things personally? Uh, it might feel like someone is attacking you, but they're really trying to help you and help you with your manuscript. Um, usually, uh, apart from that person who told you right in the third person past tense. That's really unhelpful. But there are people who will help you if you allow them to. I think it's also important. That's a good point. I also have two completely finished manuscripts that were just never going to be published. I just know <laughs> they're just, they're just dead in the water, but I did need to complete them in order to go to the next one. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm. So unless, you know, with Finding My Voice, I loved it so much. I was willing to do anything for it, including telling this very famous editor no. But with these other two books, I agree. When they're awful to read, or when they're awful to write, don't inflict that on anyone else. Like one of my books is 800 pages. I worked on it for years. I thought it was so brilliant when I, it was about this publicist and he does all such creepy things and it's very funny and there's a, something happens to his toupee and I thought it was super funny. And then I read it again and it's just never gonna, you know, but that's, that's what writing's all about is like learning your own taste and knowing when something's good and when something's bad. And I admit, I wrote two really bad novels. I might've written, oh, I actually wrote one during the gold rush to a YA novel that was really bad. <laughs> no, and actually a publisher was interested in it, but I just got so bored with it that I just couldn't bring myself to, to complete it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like it needed editing mm -hmm. and it was just, but it also made me feel that 
YA was probably, I was starting to write more adult fiction. And I think I was starting to just drop out of the YA like mindset. So I think that that was a transitional step of writing something that was historical that took place in the gold rush. Do you know what I'm saying? As opposed to high school. <laughs> so, anyways, and um, to the person who asked about a craft thing, one thing that was interesting that now that I write adult is um, I was not allowed in my book about guys called Necessary Roughness about a, an Asian American boy who wants to play football. I was not allowed to use swear words, but I was like, how can I not use swear words when I spend all this time in the locker room and it's all homophobic slurs and swear words? Like how am I supposed to write anything that's even like similar that has any kind of, you know, like texture to it. But the point was, is the librarian, like library marketing person said, you do this, it's not going to get into the, all these kids' hands because it'll be banned. Like they have these actual rules. So I kind of got around it by making up swear words, which is kind of dumb. And so that's not a great compromise, but I also think that was also one of the steps where I thought um, for my first adult novel, the, the, the character is like 19, so it could be a YA novel, but she swears so much because I just felt like, ah, now I don't have to worry about like the censors or whatever. So there is certain, do you know what I'm saying? It's not really a craft thing, but there are certain genre conventions that, that you kind of come up against your own like sort of artistic ideas of things. And a lot of it, once you start getting published is determining how much you want to compromise in terms of, because for me, I did realize, no, I'd rather have the book in someone's hands rather than it had all these up F bombs in it and never, you know, being in all these librarians lists or something, but it, it is always a kind of a weird time because it is a business as ed was saying they got to sell the book so they can stay in business they got to sell the books so there's got to be some semblance of saleability that's their job so it's not all us versus them and they're the gatekeepers there is a certain amount of you want the publishers to be <laughs> solvent so they can keep selling our stuff so yeah it's art and there's commerce <laughs> okay and then our next question is from daisy mann how did you deal with writing about things, or how do you deal with writing about things that are close to home? Um, and Daisy's writing a memoir currently. Oh. You know, I always thought my dad would hate my book because it's uh, it's kind of autobiographical. I guess, you know, I, I think it was Baldwin who said, oh, first novels are autobiographical because the writer has so much <laughs> they have to get off their chest. And some of it was super autobiographical. And the, the dad is, you, is from the little bit you read, you know, could be seen as sort of that, not a monster character, but kind of the clueless, cold dad. But um, it was really cute because he wrote me a note later saying, when are you going to write another book? Like I read this book three times and it's so great. And so sometimes when you get scared about it, like your family's going to hate it. They actually might like it. So I think it's tough. I think when you're writing it, you can't really think about how it's going to be received. I think you have to write it first and then figure out how you're going to deal with your parents or your whoever, whomever you're writing about. My mother said uh, my third book was the first one that didn't shame the family. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but they never said like stop writing or don't publish this. Oh, more like okay. it was like don't even start writing or yeah, yeah. Or, no, uh, I had that too. Or, you, you, once you're a doctor, you can write at night. That's because, exactly like, what my parents said. Yeah, that's what I'll feel. I'll feel like writing when I come home after a day at the yeah, hospital. Exactly. Apart from like drinking and drugging. Exactly. No, my dad made me a whole list of doctors who had, were also writers. Chekhov was yes, on the list. I'm like <laughs> Chekhov, come on, dude! Like they just like used sauce to. Saw people's limbs. And, and you he always had limbs. people like shooting someone off stage. Like, yeah. You see, he, because he was a doctor, he fell into that trap. <laughs> <laughs> what a hack. <laughs> okay. Um, this next question is uh, from Timothy Tao, and they're asking if there are sequels being planned for the books. No, this is it. Are you going to write any more YA, though? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Depends. But you're Depends. totally sure there's no, you're totally closing the door on that? Well, I would never close the door on anything except my foot. Oh, because I will say that I read, there is already a sequel saying goodbye to Finding My Voice. And that came about because so many people say, what happened to Ellen? What happened to Ellen? What happened to Ellen? <laughs> so much that I was like, all right, all right, already. So there is a sequel. 
And that's still in print. Yeah, make sure to buy everyone's books tonight. Um, and we have our last question. Um, and it's who are you reading right now and which writers do you recommend? Oh, wow. Wow. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm only going to talk about writers who are dead. Because I'm friends with so many writers, I can't like name some and like leave some out. Um, you know, I've really enjoyed the books by James T. Farrell. Uh, he's probably best known for writing the Studs Lonigan trilogy, but, um, I think I've read like eight of his books already and I, I find them all fantastic. Uh, he was like this Irish American guy who grew up in Chicago and, uh, he deals with race and, um, different socioeconomic groups in a way that is like so real and frank for its time. Um, and, and not surprisingly, he was a long time communist, <laughs> uh, but he's not running for president or anything. So, um, uh, let's see. Oh, I've also really enjoyed this book called, uh, a book of swindles. It's published by Columbia university press. It's a translation of Ming Dynasty tales of uh, people being ripped off. Um, and, and the thing is, in, in like Ming Dynasty China, like if you were robbed by somebody or fooled by somebody, uh, your neighbors wouldn't be coming out to like help you and comfort you. They would come out and laugh at how stupid you were. <laughs> That's lovely. Um, I'm also reading, I read nonfiction and fiction at the same time. Fiction, I'm reading this really great novel by a Korean American writer. It's called The Last Story of Mina Lee. I think her name is Nancy Julian Kim. And I will say that book is some of the best um, descriptions of food. And Koreans are super, as you probably know, super into eating. So I'm immensely enjoying that. And I'm reading a great memoir for the person who's writing memoir. Um, it's my friend, Justin Taylor. His memoir is called Writing with a Ghost. And it's a lot about his dad and just America. And it's just so beautifully done and brainy that uh, I highly recommend it. Speaking of ghosts, you know, I, I lived for a summer in a haunted house. <laughs> Where was that? Uh, this was in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania. My parents bought this uh, old farmhouse as an investment. Um, it was like super duper cheap. Uh, the realtor said uh, this couple is divorcing and they just want to sell it really quickly. So my parents bought it and made me live there the summer before going to uh, college. Um, and it had like a huge property too. It was like, it included half a mountain. Uh, and this house was built in like early 1800s. It still had like a dirt basement the uh, stairs were uneven because they were all hand hewn. Um, there was an outhouse on the property, but uh, luckily it had plumbing. Um, I had to shovel coal into the furnace uh, to, to have hot water. Um, and like, so like when, when I think about the, uh, uh, who's that guy uh, from uh, Flying Burrito Brothers, uh, Graham, Graham Parsons. He had that song called, We'll Sweep Out the Ashes in the Morning. I was totally sweeping out ashes in the morning because otherwise uh, you can't burn more coal. Uh, so anyway, um, there was a ghost in, in this house, it, you know, cause it was just me and my stuff in my room. Uh, and the, the snoring sound would come out from the bedroom across the hallway. Uh, it wasn't every night, but it was like two, three nights out of a week. Wait, did you ever see, like, was it a white person? Old no, farmer? never, never saw or... anything. Uh, you know, but I got the feeling that it was like some old farmhand or something because it would always like, you know, in the morning, I would hear a rooster crow in the distance and then the snoring would stop. Wow. It wasn't like a mean presence or anything. It was just something resting, you know. If, if I heard like, get out, I would have been out of there so fast. <laughs> But it was, it was just snoring, you know, just catching up on sleep. <laughs> okay, I like how it turned to Halloween themes. 
<laughs> ending. Thank you both so much. Um, this is so fun to moderate, and I think Neela is gonna. Thanks, Ruth. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you, Neela. Bye. Thank you guys so much. That was such a great conversation. Big thank you to Marie uh, for reading and Ed for reading and for Ruth for moderating this panel. Thank you guys so much. Big round of applause for all our, it. All our um, watchers out there. And thank you to you all for, for joining in. Um, I just wanted to say a few things. Please do. Uh, we've dropped it in the chat a few times so you can pre-order uh, David Tong can't have a girlfriend until he gets into an Ivy League college and we'll send you some shiny stickers as well uh, directly from the Kaya website. Uh, you can also, stand, can you show them your shirt, Ed? A lot of people have kind of seen it and they oh, love it. Oh, this is a great so shirt. We'll be, That's we'll make more of these shirts um, and we'll get it up on our website to, to for you to get one. So please uh, check out kaya.com uh, for that. And Ed's going to have a lot more events to promote the novel with all kinds of different writers around the country. Uh, the next one was coming up on October 30th with a Word Up bookstore in, in New York City and Washington Heights with the YA author Lilium Rivera. So that should be really great. Nice. Um, so follow us on social media, Kaya, or just Kaya Press on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and all of those things. And Please order or pre-order Marie's book, which is coming out now in December. Um, heard this reissue. Is there anything new in the reissue? Is there a, like a new essay or anything like that? I did write an afterward because oh, yeah. some of the language is a little antiquated. But what's kind of interesting is there was a lot of publisher interest and a bunch of them wanted me to change it. Social media, have cell phones. But that's the beauty of, I'm glad you had asked that question earlier, Ruth, because that's the beauty of there's so much YA now that I feel like, no, you know what? This is a period piece. I already heard on some podcasts. I'm calling me like a dinosaur. I'm like, fine. But this <laughs> is, you know what I mean? This is a, is a historical piece of a, t a particular time when people still said Oriental, like this girl who's growing up in Minnesota, that's all she hears. So she says it. So I do talk about in the afterwards, but she doesn't need to have a cell phone. Cool. Well, you can't get reception out of the abandoned mine anyway. No, exactly. <laughs> and all the plots, like they don't work and stuff. Do you know what I'm saying? Like if her parents knew where she was or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Definitely uh, check out both these books and, you know, tell tell people about them. Tell uh, tell everybody to, to check these out. And a, a big thank you, of course, to the Asian American Writers Workshop uh, for hosting us and for working with us on this event and for Kundiman. Uh, Kundiman just announced a new Asian American Feminist Writing Workshop and applications are open through November 1st. So please visit them at kundiman.org and visit the Writers Workshop, aaww.org backslash events for their amazing upcoming fall events calendar. And they have a special event partnered with the Film Forum on October 10th for presenting a screening of the film Aggie and a discussion featuring Mahogany Brown, Adnan Khan, Tanya Selva Rathnam, and moderated by Rachel Kuo. So that should be really great. Um, thank you guys so much. Good. Thank uh, you. Good thank know. you for spending Love time with us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Spending time with us. Bye. Bye. Oh, this is going to be on YouTube later. <laughs>